All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to the press availability for the Alaska Independent Democratic Coalition. I'm Representative Chris Tuck, and joining me today are our two resource members, uh, Representative Garen Tarr and Representative Andy Josephson. I want to remind everyone that the University of Alaska Coalition of Student Leaders Conference wraps up this afternoon. Over the past few days, these student leaders have been meeting with lawmakers and staff to gain insights into the session and the issues that we are addressing. The leaders have also met with members of Governor Walker's administration, and they have been basically letting us know the benefits of our university system, and they are concerned about some of the cuts that we are seeing. You look around the world, and you'll see that great cities have great universities. Also, throughout history, those civilizations that invested in education were always your most advanced civilizations. So as we look at the cuts, we want to make sure that we're focusing on cutting waste, duplicity, and we're not going to cut opportunities. Our coalition does oppose the elimination of uh, early development and pre-K, such as parents and teachers and best beginnings. Cutting two million for pre-K grants ignores the fact that currently less than half the kids who enter kindergarten are not prepared and pre-k programs help children be prepared for school and so as we go through we want to make sure that we're not balancing the budget on the backs of our children and their future edu future education opportunities the house finance committee will continue accepting public testimony on the operating budget through thursday it's important that alaskans speak up about their fiscal priorities we support cutting waste and finding more efficient ways to deliver vital services, but irresponsible cuts that will result in job losses and push us into recession, we're going to try to do our best to prevent. A strong and healthy economy creates opportunities for Alaskans, and that's what we're about with the Alaska Independent Democratic Coalition, is providing opportunities for all Alaskans. Representative Tarr. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. I'm Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage. Thanks for being here this morning. I want to build on what Representative Tuck was talking about, um, saying we're not, we shouldn't be balancing the budget on the backs of children. I think we shouldn't be balancing um, the budget on the backs of our seniors. I think a lot of people were shocked. I think it was your story that reported it, Liz, um, to read some comments yesterday from one of our colleagues suggesting that if seniors can't uh, live here, they should leave the state. I know that doesn't speak to my values or the values of the people standing here, the members that I serve with in our caucus. Um, we, we've joked that there's a silver tsunami. Um, we have the fastest growing senior population. They add tremendously to our state and we value them being here. Just today there was um, an op-ed from a former lawmaker talking about how much um, the economic impact from seniors helps our state. And so at a time when we're looking at how do we strengthen our economy and, and who has the dollars to spend, those seniors are actually a big part of um, making our economy strong. They were already um, in a moment of panic after receiving that short notice from the governor about changing from $125 to $47 for, the, for that one uh, category of beneficiaries. That's more than a 65% change. I know I immediately heard from constituents about that and, and people are really using these dollars for basic essentials, for things like food, gas, utilities, um, their medicines. My constituent is the first one who made me aware of this is, is just so distraught, is not sure if she can actually stay in the state of Alaska. It's just, we say it's a social safety net and people have just had that net pulled right out from under them. Also want to talk about um, some penny wise, pound foolish cuts that I've seen in the budget. I serve on the Department of Corrections Budget Subcommittee. That's a department that's stretched very thin. And what I found surprising was just as we were passing a budget that, that does not recognize what their true needs are and, and um, may, may cause problems, that was substantiated by a report that came out that said we need 100 more correctional officers to do a good job in our facilities. And if you think about the number of inmate deaths we've had over the last year and how some of them will likely result in lawsuits and have to the tune of 500,000, 700,000, or a million dollars to settle a wrongful death lawsuit, not to mention the, the pain and suffering of the people and the families and friends involved, but just the dollars, it will have been very penny wise and pound foolish to have not staffed up and done a good job with our correction system. I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Josephson. Thank you, Representative Tarr. Just, just one more comment on the senior benefits issue. You know, uh, if you've ever wondered whether we walk the walk and just don't talk the talk, recall that uh, one of the things that we pushed for during the 53-day, I guess, standoff on the budget in FY16 
was restoration of a large port, a large part of what had been cut from the senior benefits. We achieved that. So those cuts that they're seeing now would have been worse without our efforts. Um, the, the subcommittee process was one that the three of us worked very hard on. Uh, I'd like to comment on, on two departments in particular. Uh, the first is the Department of Law. Um, I was a former, I am a former prosecutor. I saw the demise of the Dillingham office. I think that's a mistake. I think it's much wiser to have a prosecutor on the ground, uh, someone that victims can talk to, someone who can be face to face on a daily basis with two calendars of two judges uh, interacting with the community. And so I asked for the restoration of that funding along with my colleague, Representative Guerra. I asked for the restoration of the prior Barrow office. We didn't get that, but we stood behind, frankly, law and order. Um, similarly, the governor, who's new to this job and I think has some mandate, wanted a public integrity unit, a small public integrity unit. Why did he want that? He wanted that because of concerns with use of force. We applaud our great police officers. We back them in, in their good work. But it's been a national concern. I think it was wise to want that. And as Representative uh, Tarr mentioned, there have been more uh, prison deaths than we've seen in the past. Um, again, I, I'm not saying that the corrections officers are mistaken. I'm saying we need to, to see if we can limit that kind of tragedy. And that was also going to be reflected in the public integrity unit. That, that unit was not funded. So Representative Gary and I stood with the public integrity unit. Um, in the university context, I believe that uh, President Johnson is right and that if the university suffers a general fund cut of $50 million, 500 to 1,000 university employees will be pink slipped. And many of them will come from the Fairbanks region which is already an area that even a year ago, before talk of recession began, was a troubled economic region because of fuel prices, among other things. So I think it is, as Representative Tarr said, penny wise, pound foolish. And, and I would note, and this is the important thing, every time you can leverage $4 by spending $1, as we do with our university grant system, and you, you want to just keep doing that. I mean, that just has got to make sense to, I think, even an elementary school audience gets that. And we've got to do that. And any time we forsake that and say, no, we're going to waive those extra $4, we have to say, where are we? What are we doing to our economy? So those are some concerns that I've seen in subcommittee. Thanks. So last year, as we worked on the budget, we went 53 days into um, special sessions working on those things, the university budget, senior benefits, uh, pre-K, early development, uh, public education, Alaska Marine Highway, Office of Child Services, those things that affect um, hundreds of thousands of Alaskans. We'll open up to questions. If you please uh, state your name and affiliation. Good morning. Nat Hers with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, for um, Representative Tuck, but maybe for all of you guys, wondering if you can speak to um, the likelihood that you guys are going to vote for the budget as it sort of appears to be taking shape now. Um, and if not, uh, sort of what, I'm trying to think, well, maybe I'll just start with that question. Uh, as it's progressing, you know, this is the first step of many steps in the budget process. And um, uh, we have public testimony going on right now. We have a committee substitute. Um, I probably wouldn't vote on the committee substitute as it stands, but things are still in the works. A dialogue is still happening. Um, there's still some room for shaping it, and uh, I'm hoping that it gets to a point that, uh, yeah, for the, for the House, leaving the House, that we have as much support as possible. But we're all still having dialogue. We're still having talks about that. Representative Tarr. I would just add, take an example like substance abuse treatment that had been um, cut from the Department of Health and Social Services budget. Senator Sullivan was here yesterday, gave his annual update to the legislature, talked about the addiction, the substance abuse problem we have in the state, how he's gonna put in a bill at the federal level but wants to partner with the state. I talked to his staff afterwards, sounded like they were making the rounds, talking to legislators. I'm hoping that those conversations were productive 
and that he was able to you know let people know how we could pr be in partnership with them if they can bring some resources from the federal government so I think that's one example I'm hoping to see some change and and hopeful that he had some impact on his um, you know former former peers here um, from when he worked in in this building so the, the fast answer um, Mr. Hurst to your question is no I would not vote for this budget uh, as I said in the special order on Friday uh, there are really three legs, perhaps four if you add the federal government, to our state economy. One of them has been the capital budget. I think we had to cut the capital budget the way we have the last couple of years. The other one is the oil industry. The oil industry is in a period of contraction. It says it's in a period of contraction. Um, and the third element is our state services. And we have exclusive unilateral control over that topic. And uh, I think that it's going to be very hard to get some of us to make tough votes on fiscal reform while gutting a budget. And I don't really understand the need to go in both directions. Um, I understand that there are important cuts to make, uh, but they must be surgical. And I think that approaching $300 million exceeds that, that fine surgery. So, so can I just follow up and ask, uh, do, you guys, um, do you guys think it makes sense for the House to pass a budget that does not have Democratic support and does not have a CBR draw and sort of how are you guys viewing that process sort of in the big picture of like trying to come to an agreement that doesn't take 53 extra days or however many extra days you guys said it was. Yeah, we want to make sure that the CBR draw isn't the only source of revenue as we look at this. So the CBR draw is, is going to be one of the last items that gets voted on as we look at a, a total fiscal plan. Again, we're looking at a comprehensive package, looking at revenues as well as expenditures. Can I add? Two other things I think are kind of must-haves for some people are criminal justice reform, Senate Bill 91, a lot of momentum behind that, $424 million in savings over 10 years, and Medicaid reform. We're in a place now, we've had the department get the Agnew Beck report, we've got a clear path of where we need to go. We know there are hundreds of millions of dollars of savings. So when people talk about the Scott Goldsmith model that suggests we need to shave about a billion dollars from our budget, you can get very close to that billion dollars just with those two really important measures that not only save a lot of state dollars, but the outcomes will be so positive and I believe make Alaska a healthier place, which I think is a great positive thing. So, so just to be clear, if, if, you, if, if the budget passes without a CBR vote out of the House, do you guys view that as a problem or, or is, that, is, this, is that just sort of one opportunity to to get that vote and, and you know there's plenty of time for negotiation there's really. plenty of time for that this is just the first part coming through the house um, we don't know what the Senate plans on doing until we have a complete package and, and every year the operating budget goes into a conference committee so it's through that process that um, that things really shape up in the end right now we're in the beginning stages of everything it wouldn't make any sense to give up a three-quarter vote at this stage you, you, you know in on um, on my special order that I mentioned, uh, I noted that I, I am, you know, encourage the majority to come to me and, and talk to me, call me, have coffee with me. I want to help the majority do its job. We believe we have a lot of power as members of the minority, but the majority clearly sets the calendar. They gavel in the hearings, and you know, I believe that they're in a tough spot. <laughs> that they must sort of lead the way. We can help them lead, we're trying to do that, but I think these conversations should have occurred earlier. As, as Representative Tuck said, they can still occur, but they might as well occur today because they're gonna to occur tomorrow. And that's sort of how I view that. When, when we look at uh, negotiations, there's bas basically three goals. Of course, the first is to come up with an outstanding agreement that we can all share. Um, the second is to be as efficient as possible. Part of being efficient is what we've asked is to create a Ways and Means Committee. Because when you compartmentalize everything and you look at things individually, it's really hard to find the courage to say we'll do this without looking at everything. And that's what a Ways and Means Committee does, is it looks at everything broadly and how each component um, may add to that. Um, but when we, as we go forward, we want to look at a, a total fiscal package in the end. Um, and, and, and making sure that uh, we have the opportunities to come up with something that we can all agree with. And then the third thing is, of course, building relationships along the way. So we see this as an opportunity to better connect with one another. 
Hi, Liz Rains with KTVA. And l looking through the cuts that are in the proposal right now by the House, um, I'm interested in hearing whether or not you think that the, those cuts are proportional between rural and urban Alaska, and or is one area taking a bigger hit than another? You know, uh, we do want to make sure that uh, rural Alaska is um, um, not harmed uh, through this process. One of the things that we're worried about is Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, we don't want to see stations being closed down because that's how we keep communities connected with one another. Uh, so we're looking at uh, potentially trying to get, uh, gain some of that back. Um, when we look at uh, cuts to education, of course we're concerned about that. One of the things that we've had recently was two court cases. One was the Moore versus State case and the Kasali versus the State case. One had to do with uh, capital investments in our public education. The other one had to do with, with programming, effective programming. Um, in rural Alaska, and one of the things that they said is that we that uh, in the courts they said that you need to have throwing money at the problem isn't the only solution. But you definitely need to have things such as pre-K um, and early development, and that leads to successes and letting your education dollars go forward. So yeah, we're concerned with some of the cuts and how it affects um, rural Alaska, especially with rural campuses through the university as well. You know, I have <coughs> noticed, Liz, a pattern. Um, you know, I mentioned the closure of the village, large village district attorney's offices. In DEC, we saw a $700,000 cut to rural treatment programs so that people's sewage and their water don't get, you know, mutually contaminated. Um, in, in DNR, we see closure of parks so that they're passively managed. So the further you, way, you get away from the, the rail belt, you do see that happen. I see it happen in every committee. And we don't agree that shutting down rural communities saves the state of Alaska money. We don't agree with that philosophy either. Okay. Um, uh, for Rep. Josephson and uh, Rep. Tar, I'm interested, um, since you're on the Resources Committee, in hearing your thoughts on the governor's oil tax bill, um, HB 247, mm -hmm. and uh, um, whether or not you think that's a must-have bill this session. Sure. Um, I think it's a must-have bill. And, and I'll talk about why it's a must-have bill first. Uh, it's a must-have bill because what's at issue when we talk about, and, and by the way, this isn't my bill, but I may be called to vote on it. When we talk about cutting dividends, um, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, this bill is hundreds of millions of dollars. And I have to be able to go to my constituents and say, look, uh, this happened because that couldn't happen? It, it, the point is, it must happen. You know, the, the package that the governor has brought through his tax director is imminently reasonable. And one of the things we've seen is there are at least two key features. One is the monthly calculation versus an annual calculation of taxes. One is the hard floor. One is a stacking feature where in some instances we're paying them to produce oil. Like wholly paying them. We get nothing except some royalty. Okay? And what we found is in the committee minutes, because of the price of oil being as low as it is, there was no intent identifiable in what's called the legislative history. These are almost arguably sort of accidents of law. And um, the other factor is they're just not affordable. We can't be investing in highly prospective uh, development. Um, you know, the industry, as I said, is contracting. We have to do some of that too. <laughs> and I would concur with Rep. Josephson's comments. It is a complex bill, so I appreciate that we are really diving into it. It's a little deja vu from Senate Bill 21, Senate Bill 138. The Resources Committee takes a lot of this work on. We'll have two meetings per day, you know, every day, Saturday. Um, and that's, that's the kind of scrutiny we should put into this measure because we do know how important a healthy oil and gas industry is for the state. However, as Representative Josephson mentioned, during Senate Bill 21, the lowest price we really evaluated was $60. We really did not look at what happens in, I looked this morning, we're at $32 today. We didn't look at what happened there. That's substantiated by the fiscal notes that did not talk about the impact at that low, low price level. So we've made mistakes. We learned in ACEs. We really didn't model high enough. And, and so, you know, some unintended consequences there with progressivity. Senate Bill 21, we didn't model low enough. What we really need to do when we evaluate this, it's a reasonable consideration whether we should be paying more than 100% while potentially at the same time asking Alaskans to pay something. It's a reasonable um, evaluation of the previous tax systems, how they've stacked on top of themselves. Ken Alper is 
probably more knowledgeable than almost anyone in this building on these topics. And if you watch the committee, he knows what day this you know went into law, what provision, how it happened. He was part of the conversation. He worked here through all of those, and we're, we're seeing the unintended consequences. So. Um, I think we, ha you know, have shown by the work that we're doing that we're giving it careful consideration, but everything's got to be on the table, everything. And before I'm going to ask individual Alaskans, I'm going to look around at all of the other opportunities and see if we have a fair system. We have a world-class resource, and we want to make sure we continue to have that strong industry, but there's got to be some level of fairness. And I used an example yesterday of one company, not to ding on them, congratulations for their success, but they gave each employee $100,000. Yeah, that's over $100 million. If we gave them that, that amount in credits, that means Alaskans essentially paid that bonus. And that's a difficult position uh, to defend to your constituents. Chris, we do have a, a caller online. Yes, uh, Elwood Bremer, Alaska Journal of Commerce. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, I was just, uh, good morning, everybody. I was just wondering um, where the issue of where Medicaid expansion stands in the current House budget um, and what sort of, if any, I guess, negotiations you've had either with the majority um, in the House or even the, the Senate, um, because obviously we know it's, it's going to be um, an issue on, on both sides. Where things are right now with the Medicaid expansion dollars, um, you know, going through the budget, that those programs exist. How they're applied is what's being reevaluated. The topics under consideration in the House Health and Social Services Committee are things like optional programs um, and, you know, what other particular kind of programs can be modified or changed um, relative to their overall cost to the state. There's kind of a dual process going on in the Senate. Um, Senate Bill 78, I believe, is the number for Senator Kelly's bill that's incorporated a lot of the recommendations from the Agnew Beck report. I'm very much in support of them. They're going to be great for behavioral health services, for super addressing the super utilizer problem, um, for doing a better care, a better care with uh, managed care organizations, with um, allowing some flexibility for pilot product pro, uh, projects. One of the challenges on an issue like healthcare is Alaska is like a, a medium-sized city relative to the rest of the country. We're not going to be the place where innovation takes place. What we need to do is learn from what other states have done, what other jurisdictions have done, and figure out how we can modify the best pieces of that to work for Alaska. And that's what happened over the summer. Um, the Alaska Primary Care Association and others, they convened monthly meetings. They brought folks up from three different states to learn from their experience and, and figure out how we could build on their success. The Agnew Beck report came out. Now all of that um, information is being um, incorporated into both Senator Kelly's bill as well as Representative Seaton's bill, which is House Bill 227. Um, we've had about three weeks of hearings on that particular bill in the Hess Committee, and we'll continue that work. And I, I think he hopes to um, advance his bill in the House and then that bill in the Senate, and um, we'll see kind of which one gets to the finish line first. But I think it's, it's uh, among some, one of the most important issues to address this session. We can do a much better job in our health care delivery system, have healthier Alaskans, and save hundreds of millions of dollars. And as far as no negotiations, uh, basically right now we're just concentrating on a good process um, and making sure that people have the opportunity to offer amendments, uh, at least to be discussed. And uh, when we look at that process, um, and building relationships along the way. So we're not in the final stages of to where we need to sit down and do negotiations, but we are in the stages where we need to have dialogue and shape things as it goes along so that there's less to negotiate in the end. All right, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> one, one more, uh, nobody else says. Um, Liz Rains again with KTVA, and uh, I guess this kind of goes back to the, the overarching theme of, um, you know, we talk a lot about right-sizing government, and, and the public is calling for, um, for, for trimming of government before looking at new revenue sources, and um, I guess I, I pose a question again, what is the, the right size of government um, for you? And, um, and uh, you know, we heard last week in the majority presser that they were a little bit disappointed the minority hasn't put forth a proposal um, in, in as far as a fiscal plan, and, and what would you say to that? For me, it, it starts at a, a little different place, and I think under any budget scenario, we should always be looking at how are we spending our dollars, and are we spending them efficiently and effectively, 
which brings me back to the criminal justice reform. We know that we're doing a very poor job with that, where we have you know, people in pretrial status in jails, which is very costly, nonviolent offenders, <coughs> low-risk offenders. It's, it's very, very costly. There are better alternatives that um, better support those individuals. We know that the Medicaid reform example right there, um, you know, the, the 700 or more million dollars that can be saved from that, you need to take advantage of those opportunities first in my opinion, um, so you can spend the dollars in any circumstance efficiently and effectively to accomplish what you hope, and then you look at where you make modifications, because I think naturally some of the ways you can trim government comes out of both of those exercises because of the reduced demand on the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, on the court system, you know, you just pull all of that demand out of the system and you'll, you'll get that smaller size government. Well, the, the only thing that, uh, I would add is is one thing about right-sizing of government, no one really knows quite what that means. Um, but uh, I would say that there are going to be some Alaskans who would never see enough cuts. And occasionally I'm even intrigued by the, sort of the constitutionalist argument about this sort of strict construction of what do we do. The problem, of course, is the Constitution relative to health care says we're supposed to provide for public health. Well, what does that mean? But um, I would say I would say this: uh, those who say we need to use the permanent fund earnings in some fashion, uh, and that's probably it should be the majority by now, are right. That is, we, we cannot depend on $120 oil anymore. We can do better with oil. You know, I would note that the credits we talked about uh, are going to fields often new oil that gives us no production tax until we hit $73 a barrel. So I think there are reforms and more contribution from industry as well. But fundamentally, we do need a fiscal reform package. What my caucus, I think, is looking for is balance. And uh, we applaud the governor, as we've said. We have some concerns with what he's proposed. But at least he's sort of throwing it all out there to chew on. Um, but fundamentally, we need balance. And part of the balance is not um, undercutting the work of state government. And it's not that I'm necessarily a state government booster, but I do take note of Dr. Knapp, who says, if you cut $100 million, you're going to lose 1,600 jobs. I'm trying to forestall a recession. That's critical to me. And failure to come to a consensus on a fiscal plan um, negatively impacts Alaska's credit rating. It uh, can result in loss of businesses and confidence in, in investing. And we want to make sure that we continue having um, industry investment here in Alaska. And so I think the best uh, uh, solution uh, to our fiscal challenge is a comprehensive fiscal plan. I mean, that's what we need to look at. Um, one that treats Alaskans fairly and one that uh, continues to, to draw in new revenue. When we look at uh, Medicaid expansion alone, with the governor unilaterally doing that, we've already saved $6 million in our corrections. Mm -hmm. And that's more investment coming into the state of Alaska that's still something that we're going to be working on trying to create is, is those type of opportunities. Um, <clears throat> Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. I, I was just, uh, my curiosity was provoked, I guess, like, if, if the budget ends up being something that you can't support when it comes out of the House, how likely do you think it is that the Senate makes changes that makes the budget something that's more likely you guys can support? Uh, that's a very good question. I know that uh, the Senate has an interest in maintaining some of the some some senators have uh, an interest in maintaining the university budget. Um, and again, um, as we get through this budget process, it's going to be everybody's values to get added into that. Um, so uh, certain components of it will be likely improved, I believe, and some components may end up being worse. So we just have to wait and see. Um, how everything's come come together, and, and do you see, uh, do you, do you see that there is gonna at the end gonna be some kind of a different process than there was last year? Is there anything formal that you've agreed to with the speaker and with the Senate president to to sort of change that? Or right now, you're just kind of going towards that place and you'll deal with it when you get there. Well, currently you've seen a few changes. One of them is is uh, focusing on the budget, holding all suspending all bills in the House until we get through this. Um, taking only things that have to do with um, saving money or creating new revenues. Also, 
Uh, we propose the caucus of a whole, trying to eliminate the majority-minority status as we go through this, um, just so we can continue to have a dialogue and share the burden and responsibility as, as we move forward. And of course, we've also offered the Ways and Means Committee to try to get that, that big picture looking at things. Those things are still in discussions. Um, we're hoping that uh, eventually we'll get to, get to um, one of those, but the one thing that we do know as we continue down the process, it's going to be hard for everybody to look at the broader picture of things, and, and that's where um, open dialogue needs to happen so we can um, come together. Because I think that there's more in common that we have that's allowed to be vetted, and through the normal process, sometimes people fall into their, their normal um, posture that prevents um, the coming together that, that I think Alaskans require us and expect from us. Any other questions? Yes. Um, and has there been any traction or any change since the initial introduction of the idea of the Ways and Means Committee and the Caucus of the Whole? Caucus of the Whole is still under discussion. Um, one of the things that we have to do is build trust and faith in one another. Um, there's some suspicions when, uh, when uh, people come together for the first time. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is just basically um, continue the dialogue to try to get there. So. I know that there's some interest with, with some majority members, not entirely all of them, but uh, um, basically we need to walk in confidence with one another. And I gotta say that uh, normally your first week of session, you have this good homecoming, everyone's happy to see each other and this and that, but then eventually after the first week, things start falling apart. I don't think that's happening this year. We're all kind of hanging in there, all kind of walking in together, all trying to make things happen, all kind of being, sensitive to one another's needs, wants, and desires, and that's a good thing. And so we're going to try to foster that along as far as we can so that Alaskans have confidence that we all pulled together and did what's best for all of us. Well, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week.